Digicross is without a doubt one of the Digimon mechanics of all time. To some the greatest, to some the worst, and honestly, they're both correct. In this video I'll give a brief history of how the mechanic came to be and various, various issues with it. As Kavinsky TCG breaks down in his fantastic video on Megazoo, which I'll have linked in the description and in the cards somewhere around here, there existed a viable strategy playing your boss monster for a high play cost hoping it sticks around and makes it back to you to then bully for the rest of the game. The playstyle was slowly embraced by the development team, with a few notable boss monsters such as Dark Dramon and EX1 Machine Dramon granting the player back memory to effectively reduce the play cost. Unfortunately, memory gain on a Digimon is something that can be stopped by floodgates, the community refers to as memory blockers. Instead of gaining back 10 memory to play your boss monster for effectively 3, you're back to playing that full 13 or more. It didn't feel good to have your boss monster do its 14th century European impression and get folded like a deck chair by an army of rats. So the dev team returned to the drawing board. Fast forward a few attempts later, Digimon's 10th mainline set would introduce the mechanic that debuted in Digimon's 6th season of the anime, Digicross, or Digifuse if you're talking the English version, but that's kind of cringe and the dev team also agreed. Fun little tidbit, the Cross Wars Tamers are the only Tamers in the TCG that don't use their English dub names where the opportunity was available to do so. Initial renders and pre errata cars do make mention of the Tamers by their English names, but the localization team clearly took a stance and chose to keep the old Japanese terms and names for Season 6. So what is Digicross? In the show, the Digimon, rather than Digivolving as their main source of power boosts, instead fuse aspects of Digimon onto the main Digimon, turning them into equipment in most cases. Shoutmon, the series protagonist, takes on new forms based on how many Digimon it fuses with, culminating in some pretty radical Megazoid Digimon throughout the show. In the TCG, to replicate this, the target Digimon, in this case the Band to one Shoutmon Cross 4, has an on-play cost of 9. It has some other effects, but the part we're going to focus on here is the Digicross text at the bottom of all the effects. Digicross minus 2, Shoutmon, X Ballistamon, X Darulamon, X Starmons. When you play this card, you place the specified cards from your hand battle area underneath it. Each placed card reduces the play cost. What this means is up to one copy of each of the named cards can be used as Digivolution cards in the specified order to bring its steep for a level 4 play cost down to a much more manageable 1 cost, far less than its 3 cost for Digivolution. For those paying attention, the targeted areas to add the named cards is hand battle area, requiring them to already be in play and thus thinning your board to play the card, or worse, thin your hand down and give you fewer resources for the rest of the game, just to play a single card. Cross 4 might be a strong card, but playing 5 cards from hand is a steep cost just to be playing one card. Supplementing this mechanic came an assortment of tamers that helped keep the consistency of Digicross up whilst keeping the cost of materials down. Taiki Kudo, partner to Shoutmon, and his rival Kiriha Aonuma both allow you to suspend the Tamer to play cards from under their own Digivolution sources as materials for the Digicross. How do Digimon cards end up under Tamers though? With the addition of the save mechanic. Supporting Digicross, save and material save are on deletion effects that would place the card from trash straight under a Tamer of their owner's choosing. The material save doing the same for the Digivolution cards under a Digicross Digimon up to a specified number. For example here, cross four, Material save 2 will save 2 cards. From here, recycling the materials to Digicross becomes much more consistent and allows players to have flexibility over where their cards can be sourced. Of course, deleting a tamer means saying goodbye to all those sources, but since the owner can choose where each card is saved, spreading the love is the most common way to play around this. As these cards are on play, you'd expect these decks to be slowed down by having summoning sickness, since all Digimon that are played that turn cannot attack the turn they come into play. Unfortunately, most Digicross Digimon have Rush in one way or another. For boss monsters like Dorbitmon and Sharpmon Cross 7, it makes sense that these powerful cards can be used aggressively as a boss monster that was Digivolved into normally would. But a surprising number of lower level champions and ultimates will also be making moves on your security the very same turn they come into play. It's honestly the Digicross decks that don't have Rush that stand out on the slower side. For example, none of the Bagra Army or Twilight Digimon have Rush, Except for Blastmon, but he doesn't really count because he doesn't have a Digicross requirement. He's more just force crossed by the Bagger Army Tamers, Digicross like effect, which also has the same problems with Digicross despite not being a Digicross technically. Eh. If you were to look at most of the Shoutmon Cross variants, you'd notice that most of them don't have Rush either, but instead the entire archetype has access to Rush thanks to BT10 Shoutmon's Inherit effect, which is of course in effect due to being placed under the Shoutmon Cross forms with Digicross, meaning that pretty much any Shoutmon combination is going to be attacking the turn it comes into play as long as you have the memory. The Metal Greymon of the Blue Flare deck not only has Rush, but often also gets to unsuspend and attack again during the same turn with the right inherits, which you probably have if you're using it to attack the same turn it came into play anyway. But at least you can prevent the cards from reusing sources by getting them in trash some way, right? 
surely there's no cards that can recur the pieces again, right? Digicrossing from the trash is fundamentally unbalanced. There used to be a very limited set of cards that can make use of the trash to Digicross. Mervamon, who featured in a combo that is a very vocal reason for the upcoming EX5's Anubismon being the first super rare banned card, which I did a short on, you should totally go watch. Shotmon Cross 7, and technically any Dark Knightmon, but more often than not, Dark Knight X via the option card Immortal Ruler is a fringe case if you're roleplaying. That changed though in EX4. The fourth side set for the game introduced another Kiriha, this time buddying up with Twilight's Nene Amano to let players use a card from under a Tamer and a card from Trash when performing Digicross to play a Twilight, who desperately needed this, or Blue Flare, who definitely did not. A consequence of this is the cards that were in security were often unable to be picked up due to not activating save out of security and just ending up in trash, but now could suddenly be used for digicrosses that maybe weren't possible before, boosting the consistency of decks to tournament winning success. So far you might just be thinking, oh it's just the new mechanic that the devs supported so that way they can push products. That's nothing new in card games, and to that I say you're right. The real problem with digicross is... Digicross doesn't work. In the example of Machine Dramon, one of the original attempts to legitimize Megazoo, players would play the card down, pay the cost, and then load up five pieces from trash directly under it to gain back memory for each one, or Dark Dramon would shuffle them to the top of the deck in whatever order. Basically, you're playing the Digimon, paying the cost, and getting the memory back. Effectively paying the full cost after effect resolution. When Digicrossing, players have to declare the card that they're playing, which most people do by placing it on the map. The tamer taps are then done and Digimon get their resources from your hand or from your tamers or trash, I guess in some cases. And that helps you dictate how much the cost of the Digimon be. But if you're not doing a perfect stack, may your, say be your Ballistamon is AFK, that means you're not always doing the exact number that you remember and might have to do a little bit of maths, which usually done when all the cards are on the map. So both players can see why the cost is reduced how much it should be, and figure out how much memory should be spent. Perfectly normal stuff. Except that it's technically illegal. See that tiny word there in the requirements? Wood? Wood in Digimon is interruptive. Digicross... Digicross interrupts the card from appearing to do the mechanic for a card that has not yet hit the field. The Digicross materials aren't actually in play at any point. They're not layered on top of each other like we show them as. Even though they have a set order in most cases, they're kind of just in a weird limbo until the actual Digimon is played at reduced cost, at which the materials are placed underneath it. Except they're not. They just exist underneath it as if they'd been there the whole time, like some really long melted gummy worm of a card. Bagramon introduced to set later in PT11, the main antagonist of Season 6, has an effect that forces an opponent to trash the top card of their security if it goes under another card, or if they digivolve. The first part makes it seem like it matches up well into Digicross decks it canonically is supposed to oppose, except that Digicross interrupting the onplay and sending the cards into limbo causes the cards to not be seen as moving under the onplay target, so the villain effect just whiffs. Speaking of silly whiffs, did you know that Digicross can reduce the cost even if you're not paying the cost at all? Some cards, namely the Twilight cards, can float into pieces that usually have on-play effects. But because they're played, even though it's without paying the cost, which is totally different to reducing the cost, but we'll get to that later, you can attempt to and succeed in reducing the cost further, which you're not paying, so that the on-play Digimon come down with useful sources underneath them. Which hilariously means, if you were to delete Dark Knightmon X, and it floats into Dark Knightmon with its on deletion, that Dark Knightmon could then digicross during your opponent's turn, so that it's on play, then de-digivolves and deletes a 5 play cost, since you probably have two sources thanks to Kiriha Nene, letting you use one from Trash, i.e. your Dark Knightmon X's sources, and one from Hand. I'm sure this is a developer intended interaction. For sure. Remember how I said Anubismon got banned? The most egregious example of this card's ability to play and reduce a Digimon played from trash by 6 is that BT11 Mervamon has the Digicross minus 3 modifier, one that can use cards from trash as well, meaning that this 11 play cost printed on the card is more of a 2 play cost after you reduce by 6 and then by 3. Which then also lets you play 2 Digimon for free, which can all attack on the turn they're summoned, which doesn't also help the Ignitemon, its go-to cross material of choice, then gives back a memory when a Digimon is played by an effect, like Mervamon's, 
which it sees spawn the two bodies because Digicross had the Ignite Mon there the whole time. So that 11 cost is more like a 1 cost. Until you also get memory back from the Anubis Mons inherits, but you get the idea. It doesn't always work in the Cross's favor though. Chapmon Cross 7 Superior can reduce its hefty 15 play cost down to zero, one card at a time using a literally infinite number of cards with a cross heart and or blue flare traits in different set IDs. And by placing a Shoutmon from play as the Digivolution card underneath it first, you can Digicross from trash. Which, for those keeping up, means you're putting a Shoutmon card from the field under a card that doesn't exist yet because it hasn't been paid for, which the game then acknowledges happened to let you use cards from your trash to pay for the card that just ate a card that was on the field. Still with me? Good. It gets weirder. When a card is placed under a Digimon as a source, any Digivolution sources it had are sent to trash. However, since Digicrossing is interruptive, if you, by some chance, happen to have two Shoutmon Cross 7 Superior modes, and one was already on the field and you wanted to make a second one using the Cross 7 Superior on your field, the X7S gets picked up for the Digicross, but because the Digicrossing hasn't finished, the cards underneath it aren't sent to trash yet because the on play was interrupted, leaving all those cards that you might have wanted to use from the trash to reduce your new X7S to be completely unavailable until you finish the Digicross, which instead forces players to do very silly bridges with additional Digicrosses sandwiched in between to make some sort of weird Shoutmon, Shoutmon, Shoutmon lasagna. Generic Digicrosses are actually where you get some Eldritch Horrors though. Dorbikmon just requires five Dinosaur and Dramons and a bunch of other lizard looking Digimon. Meaning you can assemble a 4 checks unsuspending Digimon with Rush to OTK your opponents by effectively just assembling the five pieces of Exodia. Yet somehow, if not even the goofiest Digicross in the game, that gold star goes to... drumroll... Yasiamon and Apossamon. And most of you will be wondering, who? Correct. These guys are arguably the worst level 4s in the BT12 cast as far as characters from the show go. These cards usually digivolve over level 3 with save in text, so you can play the rival tamers from either hand or off a top 3 gacha respectively. But crucially, unlike the hero cards, they're armor forms, which allows you to play armor texture without needing to have a white source. Yasuya and Apostu also have digicross that lets you generically use one card with save in text as a digicross requirement to bring its 5 play cost down to 3. And did you know that having a Digivolution requirement that says save in text counts as having save in text? This means that you can Digicross using Quartzmon as your only source. After that, armor texture can be used to trash the top card of your stack and then you may Digivolve into a new armor. Since it's you may, though, you can just not do that. And for the low, low cost of uh, three memory, you have cheated out a Quartzmon that then stop unsuspending on both sides for the rest of the game. And it's a 15k DP level seven that you can bully with because people probably won't be able to answer it for a while. Sure, you don't get to use it when Digivolving to force everyone to stay suspended, but being able to play Quartzmon turn one is objectively very funny. And if left unanswered, the goofy globby will get its value. Okay, so how do you actually beat Digicross? Obviously, one way is to delete bounce or source strip the tamers. No sources under a tamer, more resources they have to commit. Digicrossing is also considered a game rule rather than an effect, and you're reducing costs, not gaining memory, so floodgates like our previously mentioned bubonic plague carrier and a particularly unfriendly dragon fruit can't put a stop to it. You can't put a stop to it with Siakomon or Kokuomon because it's not a digivolution either, and you're not ignoring digivolution requirements. Luckily, the final type of floodgate exists to stop you from reducing play costs. Psychmon, the king of New York, is always a go-to floodgate for Digicross decks. Solomon fans, do not interact. I know it does the same thing, but there's a reason the community calls them all Psychmons. Can all of you that made it this far go into the comments and drop me a yo for the flood goat? Psychmon and its less dripped up counterparts don't stop players from Digicrossing, but it's gonna make sure that it almost always definitely passes turn because the players are gonna have to crack a whole lot of mem boost in order to be able to afford the full cost. They also paradoxically stop the main other counter the Digicross decks from functioning. Death X Mon reduces its play cost for every three Digimon and Tamers on the opponent's board. Most Digicross decks tend to have a plethora of tamers in order to make their resource management easier, which then makes it easier and cheaper to get Death X Mons recurring board clear on their side of the board. 
But since you're reducing its impossible 20 play cost, a lizard in a fur rug and a bottle of Henny solos the program designed to wipe out all sentient life in the digital world. The floodgates are actually so good against Digicross decks that some Digicross decks just run them to make sure their opponent can't crack back. Expect to see it a lot in US Nationals where Merv Anubis players are going to be ending their turns with Psychmons just to make sure that they're not getting hit by the Ditto. So that's Digicrossing, a mechanic that, for better or for worse, exists in the Digimon card game. What concepts would you like to see me cover next? And did you enjoy this kind of more wolf glicky, chaotic approach to the video essay? Or would you like me to like kind of mellow it back down like what we did with the Anubis short and what I will be doing with the Why It's Banned series? If you made it this far, whilst you're down in the comments letting me know, hit the like button. This has taken at least 20 plus minutes plus several hours of video editing. And whilst you're there, also subscribe means you'll know when the next one comes out and we can have fun with that one. But also, if you really liked it, consider joining the membership program. This is a very, very hefty amount of time invested and just knowing there are people out there helping financially support it will help me accelerate the progress. Speaking of members, Alexa from the future here saying that you could find yourself featured at the end of the video by name like our amazing members that have been supporting the channel so far. Tommy Tricks on the sticks at the DigiEgg tier, the first member of the channel. DHM in the Ricky tier and the Tommy NT as well in the Ultimates. Thanks to all three of those members and hopefully many more in the future. But until next time, y'all, thanks for watching.